Well, we lost another base icon last week, the incredible Tim Bogert, who was uh, a kind of a groundbreaking, trend-setting bass player and phenomenal vocalist, by the way. Played with some very uh, important bands in rock history with, with Jeff Beck and Danelle Fudge and so on and so forth. Didn't know Tim really well. We did teach at MI together. And of course, as bass players, we didn't have any performance time, but love to sit around and listen to his very funny stories. And uh, he was always so nice and generous with his time. Very humble, not arrogant about his incredible career. And uh, so I will miss him a lot. And, and I have heard from other friends of mine who were closer, who had uh, just incredible stories and, 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 and were so um, glowing in their uh, respect for Tim, uh, affectionate about his personality and his generosity. So rest in peace, Tim. We know you're going to miss playing bass, riding your motorcycles, and kind of hanging around, telling your funny and great stories. So thanks a lot, Tim. And everybody else, stay healthy. Be well. Take care. Hey, guys. Uh, thank you for including me on this tribute to uh, to Tim Bogert. Um, you know, as, as most of us all know, uh, the bass world lost, a, a true giant, um, an innovator, uh, just, just a rock God. Uh, when, when I think of like, you know, if, if there was ever going to be a Mount Rushmore of rock bassists, I mean, you know, Jack Bruce, John Entwistle, Chris Squire, and Tim Bogart would be the Mount Rushmore. Uh, and unfortunately, they're all gone now. So, you know, uh, luckily their their memory and their history lives on through an immense catalog of music and and uh, and history. Um, there's so many other rock bass players that came after these four guys, but uh, Tim was one of a kind. Um, you know, his style was, you know, I, I always equated it almost like a mixture of early influence of Jamerson and Tim Bogart. You know, picture Jamerson as a rock player. That's what Timmy was. Um, you know, it just go back and listen to the early Vanilla Fudge albums. Um, and you'll hear that influence. Uh, he was also an amazing singer. I don't actually know what his vocal range was, but when he sang, you knew it was Timmy because he'd blow your ears out. Um, you know, and those two combined, you know, I mean, I could sit and listen to Timmy play and just sing all day long without a band. Um, which brings me to my next, you know, my next topic here is not only did we lose a hero, I lost a brother. Uh, Timmy was a very near, dear friend of mine. And... Um, you know, it just hurts not not having him to call because um, we talked pretty frequently and uh, throughout his sickness, you know, I, I spoke with him and uh, encouraged him and, uh, you know, did what brothers do. Um, so, you know, it just like I said, you know, the world the world lost a hero and 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 an amazing talent. But more closely, I, I lost a brother. Um, Tell you a quick Tim Bogert story. So when I first moved to Hollywood as a student to go to MI, um, I moved out there in a U-Haul truck with my basses, a bunch of Ampeg amps, go figure, um, and my Harley Davidson. And one day I was riding into school um, and Timmy pulled up alongside me in the parking lot on his Harley. Anybody that knows Timmy knows Timmy is, is a biker in every great sense of the word. Um, so anyways, uh, he pulls up next to me, we start talking and he knew me from class, you know, I, I was already enrolled and I was sitting in on his classes and we've chatted before, but, uh, he invites me out to a Sunday ride. Uh, and that was kind of like a, a ritual it was every Sunday him and his buddies would go ride. So he invited me out and I, hell yeah. I mean, to hit my hero, one of my all time heroes is inviting me out to go riding with him. So we go out. Little did I know, Sunday, all, not only does Sunday include riding, it includes breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Now, I'm a student. I barely have two nickels to rub together. I barely had enough money to put in my gas tank to go riding that day. So I meet Timmy at his house in North Hollywood at the time. 
uh, we go for a ride. First place we stop is for breakfast. And the waitress comes around, she takes everybody's order, she comes to me, I, I'll, I'll have a cup of coffee. And Timmy looks up at me, he goes, aren't you gonna order food? Don't, aren't you hungry? And politely I was like, no, I, I, I already ate before we came, before I came. And he knew, he knew I was bullshitting him. He knew I was lying. And he knew I was embarrassed and too proud to ask for any kind of help or, he pulls a 20 out of his pocket, puts it on the table, slides it over and he goes, order something to eat. We ride together, we eat together. Don't ever be afraid or too embarrassed to ask for money or to ask for help and don't worry about paying that back. And that's the kind of guy he was. And that's, how, that's my relationship with him. He knew what I was thinking before I even said it. And like I said, up until the day he passed, you know, we, we would have conversations and just through conversations, he, you know, 3,000 miles away, he knew if something was bothering me and of course I knew what was bothering him. And, uh, and that's the relationship we had. And I got to say, I probably learned um, just as much about playing bass, uh, just as much about wrenching on motorcycles, I should say, as I did about playing bass. When we hung out, we never talked bass. We talked music and we talked stories of, of when he was in the fudge and Cactus and Beck Boger and Apathy and, and Rod Stewart. And, but we never talked about bass playing other than I like this guy or I like that guy. Uh, it was all that, the only time we talked about bass playing and technique and, and actual lessons was when I was in school with him. Other than that, it was motorcycles. And, you know, years later, I moved back to New England and, um, you know, it, uh, we, like I said, we still kept in touch and I'd come home from a ride and I'd call Timmy and he would just have either been in the middle of a ride with the three hour time difference or, uh, but we talked, you know, it was like, man, I had an amazing ride. And when I bought my new bike, he called me up. He says, man, how do you like the new bike? You digging it? Um, you know, it's just, th those are the conversations I'm really going to miss. Sorry, but, um. You know, it, it, that, that's the kind of guy he was, though, man. He was just, he, he'd give you the friggin' shirt off his back, but he'd also tear your new one. It, you know, if, if you didn't bring your A game to his class, um, or, or, you know, just if you weren't on your A game at any time, he'd, he'd let you know. And that's what brothers do. He'd be honest with me and say, you know what? What's wrong? Or what's bothering you? Something's bothering you. Something's up. You, you're riding like shit. You're playing like shit. You're singing like shit. <laughs> you know? And, and that's, and, you know, but that was, that's, that was the East Coast in him. You know, he grew up in Long Island and, and that was the New Yorker in him. Um, but, uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm truly going to miss him. The world's going to miss him. Like I said, uh, he left behind a great legacy of music, a great collection of music. Listen to the early Fudge albums. Listen to the first Vanilla Fudge album. That album has influenced so many players. Um, then from there, you know, Beck Boger and Napacy and, and Cactus and all the other collections of work he's done. Um, he really is an icon. He really is an icon. And, uh, you know, just think that Mount Rushmore of rock, that would be to, and granted, there's other bass players, you know, I, I'm, I know I'm leaving out Giza Butler, John Paul Jones, all these other cats, but if you really think of the heart and soul, the foundation of what a rock bass player is and was, those cats, those four cats, they, they solidified, and I hear a lot of, you know, I hear a lot of my, a lot of Timmy's playing in my playing because I come from a, 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 a Jamerson influence as well, but I'm also a rock player. So, um, so that's my Tim Bogert story. I've got millions of them. I've got millions of Tim Bogert stories. So if you ever catch me at a NAMM show or in one of my clinics, just ask me. I'll be happy to share them because I always love talking about my brother Timmy. Okay? That's it for me, guys. Love you. Dale, again, thank you for including me in this. Love you, man. And uh, play more bass, guys. Hey everybody, Luis Espayat here in Nashville speaking to you today about the great Tim Bogert who we lost recently, unfortunately. If I had to, in one word, describe Tim's playing, it would be expressive. He is such an expressive player in everything that I've seen about him. Um, unfortunately, I never saw him live, but everything that I've seen online 
with him from his work with Beck Bogard and Apice, Vanilla Fudge and Cactus. There's a great video online that I saw from 1974 of, uh, sorry, 73, of Beck Bogart and Apice doing Superstition by Stevie Wonder. And it is, again, expressive, uh, not only in Tim's playing, but also in his singing. And especially that song in particular, that's one of those songs that, you know, every cover band does, it's a standard, and there's a lot of people that do it, but they lose the soul of it. Man, if you watch this, if you don't get up and move, you've got no soul. You've got no heartbeat. It's so great. Um, another thing I saw also was a video from uh, 2004 of Vanilla Fudge playing uh, at the Rock Class show. And that is, again, just amazing. Uh, Tim, not only his uh, playing, just playing the snot out of that bass, but also singing uh, phenomenally. And another thing I, that I really admired about Tim was his involvement with education with his many, many years working with BIT. And uh, it's just amazing to see somebody like that that is such, you can tell he really puts his heart into what he's doing and to see that extend into the educational field as well is something very, very admirable about that man. Another thing too, and this is something obviously growing up listening to Billy Sheehan and Billy always referring back to Tim as his main influence. And you can see that, but again, that goes to the expressiveness of his playing. Not only the expressiveness, excuse me, of his playing, but also his innovation with the instrument. Uh, you know, going into the realm of multi-string instruments, not just four-string, but five-string, six-string, and whatnot. And then his use of effects and to really get that expressiveness across as well. Um, so it's something that I really, really admired about Tim and going through the videos and seeing what he's done in his lifetime. Those are my thoughts about Tim, uh, you know, world's lost yet another great player and it's sad to see that. Uh, but thankfully with modern technology and the archives that we have, we can go back uh, for generations in, in, to come and enjoy his playing and what he brought to the instrument. And not only what he brought as a player, but again, as an educator and his belief in that. So it's really great to see. So I hope to see everybody soon. Stay safe and uh, have a good one. Take care. Remembering Tim, um, bunch of memories always just come flooding in all the time. But you know, besides the you know the first time I was turned on to to like Vanilla Fudge or BBA or Cactus, I was in high school and my teachers were. Uh, I had two teachers in high school who were huge fans of. Cactus and Vanilla Fudge. And I remember moving out to California and I remember going to Musicians Institute in the very first day of BIT, some March of 19, long time ago. And uh, I remember walking into uh, his office hours, his open counseling. And I'd gotten there right at the top of the hour, right when it started. And he was already sitting in there. He had his, he had a cup of coffee and he had his six string Tobias laid out, was plugged up, ready to go. And he had a great big smile on his face, that great big Timmy smile. And he's, he said, uh, hi. And I said, hey, my name's Albie. And he says, I'm Tim. Let's get plugged in. Let's, let's play some blues. And um, through that first meeting, I explained to him how much I like to sing and play as well and wanted to work with him on that. And, there were so many classes and, or so many open counselings and stuff where it was literally like having Tim as a a private instructor for bass and, and for voice. And uh, his energy and his spirit for, for both sides of playing and singing and melding the two together was just amazing. I never, I mean, it, and it ties it into probably my greatest memory of him or my fondest memory of him was... Uh, uh, the bass player five year anniversary concert. Um, it was at a NAM show, typical, you know, NAM shows. They had a, they had assembled a huge array of styles of bass players of uh, John Patitucci and Timmy and John Entwistle, Jeff Berlin, Dave LaRue. The list went on. Verdine White. It was just, it was amazing. 
And, uh, you know, it was your typical NAMM concert. Everybody's out there uh, playing their look what I can do, look what I can do, black and a black and a black and a stuff. And then uh, Timmy came out to perform and by himself on stage. He played and sang Rosalie, uh, just accompanying himself, a little chord melody on and walking through the bass line of it. And it was it was just amazing. I mean, because he was in such command and just big grit on his face and voice just sounded amazing. The playing was amazing. And the and the best part about it is if you could ever find if you ever find the uh version of that um there was no overdub that uh, he never redid it it was if you are lucky enough to ever find that five-year anniversary concert what you hear is what we heard that night and that was probably one of the best versions of rosalie i ever heard him do and um yeah just miss him Hey, all my Bass Jet family, this is Roy Vogt coming to you from my uh, home studio and music room outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I mentioned last week about Tim Bogert. We were talking about power trios, and uh, of course we lost him about a week and a half ago, which is a terrible loss for the bass community and music community and just the planet. But... Uh, you know, like everybody else of my age, I first became aware of him through his work with Vanilla Fudge, which was just incredible. And then from then on, you know, from thence to Cactus, from thence to um, to uh, Beck Bogart and Apathy, just phenomenal. And then, you know, I remember reading about him in Bass Player in 1979, and he was playing with Boxer and some different bands, and doing some incredible stuff. And then I didn't really think about him for years. And one of my former students, Holly Montgomery, ended up being the, uh, she left Belmont and finished up her education at Musicians Institute. And um, there was a time I was there in 1986 to film Solid Gold with a country band. And I went in to, uh, to uh, Musicians Institute, which for me was like going to Disneyland because... My friend Jim Lacefield, another great bass player who's no longer here, was teaching there, as was um, Jeff Berlin, and Jeff and I you know, got to hang a good bit. And uh, in the midst of all that, I met Tim, and the one thing that struck me about Tim, because he was friends with Holly and was just hanging there, was just how open and how nice he was. He was a genuinely nice person, and uh, so... That goes along with all the other things that you can say about how astonishing of a bass player he was and how great of a singer he was. Man, he was r ridiculous. Just like all that Beck, Bogart, and Apathy stuff that he did, man, he is just nailing the vocals. He was the total package for a rock bass player, and he wasn't afraid to step out and change and, and try things. He was one of the first hard rock guys to use a six-string bass, which... Because I'm a six-string player a lot, that's near and dear to my heart. Anyway, I miss you, Tim. Wish I had had more time to spend with you and get to know you better, but I'm glad I got to meet you. All right, everybody stay safe out there, practice hard, keep it low, and I'll see you next week. Well, hello, bass family. My name is Christopher Maloney. I'm a former Los Angeles-based session bass player and current music business owner here in Jupiter, Florida. I was also on the bass faculty at the Bass Institute of Technology, for 15 years, and the reason why you should care is that I got Tim Bogert stories. Yeah, Tim Bogert was a huge part of uh, Musicians Institute, a huge part of my experience there, both as a student and as an instructor. He's just a great guy. For those of you folks who never got to meet Tim, you really missed out a little bit. He, he, he was a fun guy to hang out with. Um, he had this Cheshire cat grin of his. It was all teeth. <laughs> so he'd smile at you and, hey, no, hey, and just this big toothy grin and just, just a great positive energy to have. And he was a great mentor to a whole slew of musicians. He was a bass teacher at MI, 
But he also had something called open counseling. Those are open lessons. Anyone could walk in. All of the teachers had them. But Tim's had, Tim had one that was specifically for people who wanted to sing. Not for vocal students, but for bass players and drummers and keyboard players who wanted to work on their singing voice. I went to it many, many times, and he was just great. He had this way of unlocking your range while lowering your inhibitions to sing. You know, people would walk in there and they'd be like, I want to sing higher. And, okay, well, you know, pretend you're saying hi to somebody. Say, hi. They go, hi. They're all nervous. And to me, no, come on. Pretend you're calling your friend down the street. Go, hi. And the guy would go, hi. And you go, there's your note. There's your note right there. <laughs> the big grin. And, and people would walk out. I mean, he'd only spend, you know, there was a whole bunch of people there. He only had an hour or two. So he would spend five or ten minutes with each student. And man, people would leave there with their heads buzzing. Just like, wow, I, I could hit this note. I could do this. And strangely enough, I would ask my fellow students who are actually vocal students, I'd say, who's your favorite vocal teacher here at the school? And they'd say, Tim Boger. I'd say, Tim's, Tim's not even a vocal teacher. And they said, we don't care. His open counseling is amazing. I'm like, you're not supposed to go to his open counseling. It's for, it's for us, the non-singers. And they'd be like, we don't care. He's that good. He's just got something. So it was great to work with him as a student to work with him as a colleague. And once he left Musicians Institute, I was fortunate enough to keep in touch with him. I was working on uh, solo albums of my own where I wanted to sing on them. And so I knew that working with Tim, once again, uh, could really help up my game as a vocalist. So I'd go to his house in Simi Valley and we'd talk about his time in the business and what he was up to currently. and. You know, he, he always had a great, funny answer to any question you had. I remember one time asking him, because he played six-string bass, I said, Timmy, why do you tune your bass like a guitar? Because for you six-string bass players out there, I'm not, I can barely handle four. But uh, the high string is a C string. Everything's tuned in fourth. But Tim would tune his high C string to a B like a guitar player. And he'd play all these great big, thick-sounding bar chords. And I, I would ask him na naively, why do you tune your bass like a guitarist? And he said, you know what, Christopher? Millions of guitar players, they can't be wrong. <laughs> and so I, I just thought it was a, a great comment. And again, he was able to play all these great chord shapes just like a guitar player was. So, you guys, it's, it's, it's a sad day, but he was a great presence to have on this earth. I'm very grateful to have met him and to have studied under him at various points in my career and to be able to call him a friend. And finally, I would just also like to have a shout out to one of my dearest friends and a person I respect almost as much as anyone in the world. And that man is Dale Titus. Dale was very helpful in the beginning of my career. I owe a lot to him. And so I hope you all appreciate being part of his family and for putting these videos together. So, hope you guys enjoyed the Tim stories. I hope you feel a little bit closer to Tim now that you've heard some of those anecdotes. And I wish you all well. Stay safe. Keep on thumping. Everything bass. Hope everybody's doing well. This is Maurice in uh, little rainy Los Angeles today. Very nice, though. Um, we are remembering Tim Bogart. And, uh, yeah, we lost him on the 13th of this month. And uh, that's very sad. This is happening too much, but uh, the uh, the contribution he made, and and you know he is a pioneer in the progressive rock scene, and, and uh, also quality vocalist as well. And uh, yeah, I've been uh, pulling him up on Spotify ever since this happened. I should remember him uh, on a more regular basis, but uh, yeah, he will be missed. And like Dale, and like Dave Keith, I am related to him in the way that uh, you know we are faculty members of Musicians Institute. I got to meet him a couple times, but uh, he was kind of going out as I was coming in. And there wasn't a whole lot of uh, Tim on campus at that time, but I did meet him a couple times and he was a great man. And a uh, very uh, true, genuine musician, definitely from the old school cut. And 
he brought that to his teaching and he brought that to the workshops and uh, all the, any student that had him, you know, or had, had the experience of being in the classroom listening to his instructions and, and uh, his take on how music should be approached and things like that, where it's a, uh, was definitely a better uh, musician on the, on the other side of that. So very thankful to Tim and, uh, and uh, deepest sympathies to his family and loved ones. And uh, yeah, I'm glad we have all the recordings so we can bring him up and listen to him. I've been uh, definitely listening to uh, the power trio of Bogart back in a piece and uh, because uh, Dale introduced that last week. So thanks Dale for that. And thanks for uh, putting this question out there or not a question, I guess discussion. It's a, uh, it's a true legend. We will miss him. Until next week, I will see you then. Take care of you. Bye. Uh, so first off, <clears throat> I just want to send my condolences to all of uh, Timmy's family, to his friends, and of course his fans. Um, what an incredible guy. I mean, uh, so my dad had the first vanilla fudge record and um i remember seeing it when i was a kid as a record collection and i remember pulling it out after i started playing bass when i was 14 and checking it out a little more and of course it's mind-blowing record you know um so uh going to mi and knowing that tim bogert was one of the instructors there. I couldn't wait to meet him, of course, and uh, maybe learn a thing or two from him as well. Um, first week of school, show up, this, this guy from Michigan, and uh, right in the heart of Hollywood, had no idea what to expect. Of course, you know, everyone else there is better than me, you know, and, um, it was just a little freaked out, you know, a little bit overwhelming. I remember going into the uh, Blues LPW, live playing workshop, and Timmy was the uh, instructor for that class. <clears throat> this was during the uh, first week of school, and uh, I think they were playing Cross Cut Saw by Albert King. <laughs> and I knew that tune from playing in bands and stuff, so I got up there and I play it, and... Uh, <laughs> Timmy comes up to me afterwards, and he's doing the thumbs up. He goes, hey, that was real smooth. Come back next week. And uh, I was like, right at that point, um, <clears throat> that's when I knew it was going to be all right. And uh, it was all right. So I was showing up to Tim's blues class every week and I was going to Tim's open counseling. And uh, the amazing part about that is uh, the first couple of weeks there'd be, you know, anywhere six, eight, 10 people crammed in one of these little practice rooms huddled around Tim, soaking it all up. <clears throat> By week two, it was just me and Tim. And it was like that for at least a two solid years. You know, uh, the start of every quarter, it'd be crowded. And that was fine. By week two, it'd just be Timmy and me the rest of the quarter. So I got like two solid years of, you know, private lessons with Tim. Um, it was kind of the same thing in the Blues LPW. Uh, there might only be a couple bass players, so I would get to get up and, and play the song, you know, two, three, four times, which was great. Um and Timmy was one of those teachers at MI. Um, you know, he would always praise you when you did well. And if he did have a critique, um, not only would he do it in a, a very, you know, uh, kind way, he, it wasn't mean at all. Um, it was always exactly what I needed to hear, you know. Uh, Tim used to have this class called Rock Performance. And if you were in a band, you could sign up. Uh, I forget how many days in advance. 
but it was competitive to get into this class. It was once a week. And uh, I remember like showing up to the MI library at six in the morning just to make sure I could sign up my band for a slot, you know. So the band I was in at the time, Packard 8, I was playing upright bass. It was a rockabilly band. And anybody that plays rockabilly upright knows that it's like wrestling a wild bear, you know. Um, so we get up there and play. By the end of the set, my hands and arms have turned into just like two flippers and I'm just like beating on that bass, you know, and we made it somehow. And that was only like two or three songs, you know, <clears throat> and Timmy comes up to me afterwards and uh, puts his arm around me and he's just like, Greg, you got to calm down, babe. It's okay. You're going to kill yourself up there, man. Just chill out. Okay. Just relax. Then like the next day I saw him or whatever and he and he told me the story about uh when he was in cactus and he played in front of Hendrix and he and his hand turned into a claw, you know, right at the beginning of their set. And um that's some um, advice that I took with me, you know, take to me to this day, you know. I was playing in the dicky sometimes mid set, I had to claw up and I would just think about Timmy saying that to me and I would just relax and at least be able to make it through the rest of the set, you know. But again, that's the way Timmy was, man. He, uh, any criticism was delivered with, you know, kindness, and it was always exactly spot on. You know, some people can just say, no, that's wrong or whatever, but they can't tell you how to correct it, you know. Uh, Timmy would tell you how, what to work on, you know, which was always uh, useful to me, you know. Um that's one of the things that, you know, made him a great teacher. And, uh, and in like going to his open counselings all the time and do his classes, you know, you start becoming friends. Like I would show up to a counseling, there'd be nobody there. I'm like, how you doing, Timmy? You know, I'm pulling my bass out. He's like, eh, I'm all right, but my hands are kind of sore. I, uh, you know, put a new front end on my Harley last weekend. So my hands are kind of tight. I'm like, oh, Har what do you... You know, what are you riding, you know? When we just sit down, we start talking about motorcycles, you know, or we'd start talking about hot rods or drag racing, you know, stuff like that. And that's how you become friends, you know? Be like, uh, you can ask Galby, Dino, and if you hear me saying those names and you're watching this, you probably know who those guys are. You know, one of Timmy's favorite things to say to his friends was, hey, let's go get a cup of coffee, you know? And uh, sometimes we'd just do that, you know? Uh, one of the things I felt, uh, I was talking to Albie about this the other day. One of the things I felt really honored to be part of is when Timmy got inducted to the Guitar Center Rock Walk uh, Hall of Fame. Um, I don't remember what I was doing at the school that day. Um, I just remember going to get Albie. Albie locked up the player's store in the middle of the day, and we, uh, you know, wasn't that far of a walk. We walked down Sunset and went to Guitar Center, and, um, you know, of course we saw Timmy, and he was floating on air, and it was amazing to watch, and, of course, well-deserved. And I still have the poster from that, too. I grabbed one of the posters from an inside Guitar Center. And... Uh, Man, they're up at that podium talking about these guys, and they introduced Tim, and Albie and I just went freaking berserk. You know what I mean? We made sure to let him know that, you know, we're there for him, you know. And that was just, uh, that was amazing to be uh, part of that, you know. It was just as amazing to see him. Uh, we go to see his shows regularly, whether it was at MI or at the Roxy or wherever, you know. And that was always mind blowing and just watching him play because uh, Timmy was the kind of bass player that could just hold it down. He could be holding it down for one minute and the next minute he's doing something that's making you go, what the fuck did he just do? I mean, and it was just, and it was, I mean, it, all the time like that from him, you know, 
And if he saw you watching him while he was playing, he'd give you that little Timmy smile, you know, or a wink, you know. Or afterwards, he'd be like, how'd you like that, babe? You know, I fucking loved it, dude. Of course, you know. I think, uh, you know, along with, like, his generosity, like, sharing his knowledge with uh, playing the bass, um, when I bought a Harley out there in LA, I picked up this old shovel head and, uh, you know, there's probably some of you watching this, seen that bike, you know, it wasn't a showpiece or nothing. It was just an oil leaking, loud ass, rattly shovel head, you know? And uh, I called up Timmy, I'm like, hey, let's go for a ride. You know, I've got this new bike, I want you to check it out. Go up there and, comes out he's taking a look at it he's like yeah that those aren't the right head bolts for that shovel head hold on a second and he walked over to his workbench and opened up a drawer and pulled out the right bolts you know yeah that coil cover that's not hold on i got a, i got the right coil cover for that too you know pull, opens up another drawer boom pops out a you know box with a coil cover in it um yeah, Greg, that uh, speedometer, that's that's not the correct speedometer for this year shovel, man. Hold on. I got I got some stuff out in the shed. Next thing you know, he's got a box full of shovel head parts for me that I had to come back with my pickup truck and grab, you know. That's just the kind of guy he was, you know. And uh, before we even went riding, we were turning wrenches on my bike a little bit, you know. Uh that's the kind of guy he was, you know? And I think, um, it, it's funny, there's still stuff that I practice to this day that he has showed me. But I think, um, the best lesson I ever learned from Timmy and this wasn't, um, this wasn't something that he said to me or told me or, uh, hey, check this out. The best les lesson I learned from Timmy just from watching him play is um, when you walk into the room, just say, look out, the motherfucking bass player is here. <sighs> yeah, because when I moved to L.A. from Michigan, I was pretty shy. <laughs> shy about my play and everything. And just from uh, becoming friends with Tim and hanging out with Tim, learning from Tim, I just learned just to walk into the fucking room and be like, here's the fucking bass player. Dig on this, you know? That was the biggest thing I got from Timmy. So. Yeah, Timmy meant Timmy meant a lot to a lot of people. A lot of people. You know, there's that saying, you know, never meet your heroes. Um, and the idea behind it is that, you know, you might meet someone you've you know really admired and really inspired you, and you meet them, and unfortunately, maybe they're having a bad day. Maybe they're just not a nice person. Or maybe they just can't possibly live up to the image that you built for them in your own creative mind. That rule does not apply to Tim Bogert. Uh, as I mentioned in a previous video, seeing that Tim Bogert was on staff at the Base Institute of Technology um, 
in Hollywood, California, when I was looking for a school to go to, was a major plus. I, I, I couldn't imagine that a kid from Durham, California, who was surrounded by people like, you know, in exposing me to cactus, vanilla fudge, Beck Booker and Apsy, um, that I'd actually get a meet and, and learn from Tim Bogert. Uh, I, uh, when I did meet him, it was, he, he, there was no way he could possibly disappoint me. Being able to hear him play, hear him sing in person, um, how free he was to share uh, ideas in his open counseling and help you, um, how friendly, you know, he was. And, you know, he loved everybody. Like, you went in, like, every student. If You know, I had long hair and, and a rocker guy, and he was cool. A guy come in with short hair, was primarily a jazz player. He loved that guy, too. And, um, yeah, uh, you know, for those of you who don't, aren't familiar with the way Musicians Institute was um, set up, uh, every Wednesday they, would have, they had a huge, wonderful uh, performance hall called P100. Every Wednesday, you could sign up for a, a slot for you and a band to get up and perform, and it was videotapes. So you could go back later and, and critique your videotape, but it was hosted by Tim Bogert, and uh, wow. Um, so imagine that. You know, here, this gentleman who has so much experience and has toured the world over multiple times and was, you know, friends with Jeff Beck, friends with Led Zeppelin, all these things. He would watch you perform, and regardless of what genre, even though it was called rock performance, you could get up and play really anything. Uh, but he would come up afterwards, and you always were like waiting because sometimes he'd come up with a big smile on his face, give you a thumbs up. If one of the persons in the band shined, uh, he would go right over and pat him on the back and say some kind words. But sometimes he would give you the, you know, and but never just like that. He would come over and specifically say, "Here's how that could have been better." And, uh, and I learned so much from him um, in open counseling, in his rock performance uh, class. Now, um, not a lot of people may know this, but, uh, you know, uh, the first interview I ever did for a magazine um, was with Tim Bogert. Um, I was writing a monthly uh, article for Bass Player Magazine. It was a back page called Creative Explorations. And um, Jim Roberts asked me if I would uh, do a quick little update, catch everyone up on what Tim's doing. And so Tim and I went to this little cafe that was in this alley behind the school and sat down and I was so green. And even though by that time I had known Tim for several years and uh, considered him a friend and hopefully he considered me a friend, I was nervous because what I was, you know, our conversation was going to be recorded and put in this magazine. And Tim knew that. And he immediately like relaxed me and we started laughing and talking and I'd ask a question and he would answer it in a better way than I asked the question which means that I later would go back and kind of tweak the question because his answer was so good. Uh, Tim I'm gonna miss you bud and uh, I thank you that you were so free with all your knowledge and your experience and um, uh, yeah and I, I, you're very important to me, and you will live on forever and ever as long as we can listen to your music, watch those videos of you on YouTube playing, and just remember how amazing of a person you are. Love you, Tim.